Hello, everybody. Welcome to another office hours session. Um, it is lovely to see so many of you from so many different parts of the world. Uh, for those of you who are meeting for the first time, my name is Apurva Ashok. I'm the Director of Open Education and the Assistant Director at the Rebus Foundation. And I work on the Rebus Community Project. Um, we really try to build human capacity in OER publishing and open education through um, professional development, the publication of free openly licensed resources, and through sessions like this one, Office Hours, which we've been co-organizing with the Open Education Network for many, many years now. Um, before I pass it over to Karen, I also just want to acknowledge that I'm joining you all today from the traditional territories of many nations. I'm joining you from the territories of the Misagas of the First Credit, the Anishinaabeg, the Chippewa, the Haudenosaunee, and the Wendat peoples. Um, I'm very grateful to be here on this territory. I'm grateful for the privilege to be able to live and meet and learn here and look forward to um, conversing with all of you and learning more about where you might be joining us from today. Karen, over to you. Okay, thank you, Akurva, and um, welcome everyone. We are so glad you could join us for another session of Office Hours. I am the Publishing Director with the Open Education Network. My name is Karen Lauritsen, and we are a community of professionals working together in higher education to make it more open. And if this is your first time joining us for Office Hours, uh, we are going to turn to you for questions and conversation after we briefly hear from our guests. It's intended to be a casual conversation. As we all come together from different parts of the world, I'm joining you today from San Luis Obispo, California, which is the traditional land of the Northern Chumash. And today we're going to discuss showing your work, tools for reporting impact. We are joined by Tara Labar, who's Associate Director of Academic Affairs with the Kansas Board of Regents. Barb Thies, who's community manager with the Open Education Network, and Amelia Bell, who is coordinator of evidence-based practice with library services at the University of Southern Queensland. We're so delighted to have the three of you with us today, as well as all of our participants. We invite all of you to contribute to the conversation. I'm sure that many of you are also engaged in reporting the impact of your OER programs, learning to make a case, and to tell stories about why it's so important to support OER development and open education. And so we invite you to chime in in the chat. And then, um, as I mentioned, we'll turn it over to you for conversation after we hear from our guests. So I think that's it. And to kick it off, I will hand things over to Tara. Great, thank you very much. I'm excited to be here. Um, what I've learned in my 18 months of being with the Kansas Board of Regents and working with the OER, the Kansas OER Steering Committee, is that um, no matter how much you know about OER, you never know enough about OER, right? And you never really feel like you are an expert. And I definitely don't feel like an expert, but I'm excited to be here to share at least some of the things that we've done um, with our steering committee um, as as members of as OEN members and and how we've used the dashboard to uh, expand our faculty workshop programs, expand our and and kind of use a state stipend grant with those, and then also what I I started to uh, collect some of the the adoption data in there. So I'm I'm excited to show you what that looks like as well. Um, so I'm going to share my screen here. And let's see, um, a little bit of background on the Kansas Board of Regents. The state of Kansas has 32 public institutions, um, seven public universities, and then um, uh, seven public universities, seven technical colleges, and then 19 community colleges. And we are the governing body for all of the public universities. And then we coordinate with the community colleges and technical colleges across the state. And so, um, so it's a, it's a, it's a partnership, but it's also something that we kind of all have to walk together on because we all have different governances until the state tells us what we have to do. And then we all have the same boss. So, you know, it's, uh, it's, um, it, it, we do have a lot of collaboration. And one of the great things about the OER steering committee is we do have representation from 
all different types of institutions and most of our institutions are represented on that steering committee. And so the work they've done together to um, advance OER, OER initiatives across the state has been phenomenal in the last two. I think they really started, they started slightly before I joined the team, maybe a year right before COVID. So in the three years that this group has been going, um, just the the programming about OER has been really exciting um, statewide. So you can see here, so this is our OEN dashboard. We joined um, a year ago as a consortial member. A couple of our institutions are institutional members from OEN, and we had some trainers that had worked, uh, specifically a trainer from um, University of Kansas that was very connected with OEN and, and um, and then another trainer at Fort Hayes State University was connected with OEN, and so we had some we had some folks that were really connected and and spoke highly of the organization, and and so we were able to do this, and we saw this membership as a way to um, share their resources and specifically the programming with all of the institutions in our system across the state, and so last uh, year, the spring of twenty one, we implemented five faculty workshops and you can see that using the oen faculty workshop model and then we had um you know faculty from across the system these filled up super fast we kept them moderately small um so that we could encourage discussion they filled up very quickly um and then and then we invited just like the you know the workshop model does we invited the participants to uh, go into the otl and um enter an online review if they chose to and if they did that then they were eligible for 150 dollars stipend from the state so we've been doing that this fall we continued that workshop series by offering another six workshops again multiple institutions we used our trainers we did all of these um workshops were virtual and so we used you know here we were using the um the OEN dashboard kind of as it was intended, as it was presented, and as a way to register for those um, workshops and track um, participation. And what's nice about the dashboard is that um, Barb's team, they have created all the um, the registration, the emails, the, the communication to go to these participants and make it very easy for us to put this together. And especially for me at the um, Board of Regents office location, one central location, it was very easy for me to just put the details of the event in, um, you know, in the dashboard and then the emails were sent directly or we send out the registration people signed up um faculty signed up to the the one they wanted to attend it was it was really slick um what it also created though is all of these participants come with a email you know and a contact which has been nice and so we did 11 workshops last year over the course of 2021 and we realized we still had quite a bit of grant money left over and so we transitioned this model into using it for our institutions and we opened it up to any of our 32 institutions to hold a training for their faculty um, as a professional development event we said we'll provide you the trainers if you want to offer the stipend we have enough money to offer a stipend and so you can see since january we've had several of these um, institutions reach out and create their own we have another one coming up next week johnson county community college and you know these vary from the professional development that everyone has to take to an optional session uh, created just for faculty and so really just letting the institutions they can be virtual they can be in person um and with this model the, the participants don't register through the the dashboard um the contact just sends me who signed up now that really has been the extent of how we've used the dashboard uh, up until um, a couple weeks ago, because as I was looking, um, the dashboard was recently redone, and um, and and so I had used you know activity things to send out invites and reminders and and track um, our stipends and things like that. But as I looked over on this reporting status, they added a couple things. Well, all of these graphs were empty. 
And really the only thing I would scroll down and the only graph I would see is this. And I'm kind of looking at this going, boy, it would be really, really cool to be able to see student savings, student impact, faculty using OER. So uh, there, one of the surveys that was added recently from OEN to the dashboard was, is called an adoption survey. And we hadn't played with that yet. And so what I did was I clicked on the adoption enrollment update and I sent that out to all 188 faculty that we had interacted with during 2021. Now, again, these are small numbers and this is just a start, but this is the information that I got back from those 188 participants. And so just that small slice, and, and, and really it's probably only about 50 or 60 participants that have really answered and responded. All of a sudden this data started coming to life too in ways that I now I'm thinking, ooh, how can we do this? Like, how can we replicate this on a larger scale? How could we get this out to all of our institutions? Um, because this was really exciting to see. Um, so Barb, did you want to chime in here? I think I'll let Amelia go. This is giving me great ideas and I'll circle back on it. Thank you, Tara. Cool. No worries. Well, so this is literally what this is the start of kind of what got me excited about looking at different ways that we could use that and, and you know, and maybe even twisting OEN's arm a bit to see if there's a way that we could share that survey with more than just workshop participants. You know, if there's a way that we could send that out to our whole entire system or something, something in that aspect. But I do, I love the simplicity of this survey. Uh, I think it's five questions or six questions. It's very easy and it talks very clearly about what, what class you're teaching, um, how many students, you know, talking about sections and numbers of students and really getting that um, concrete information from the faculty member that's answering the question. And so I, like I said, this is a cool tool that I am excited to play more with. And so with that, I kind of will maybe toss it to Amelia and um, be happy to answer questions as we go along today. And I'll stop sharing. There we go. Wonderful. Thank you. And hi, everyone. Um, so I'm going to talk a little bit on how we've highlighted the reach of USQ's open text, which are on the Pressbooks platform using Power BI as a data visualization and dashboard tool. And this is work that's emerged from conversations between two library teams. So that's the open educational practice team and the evidence-based practice team, which is where my role is. So we had several initial discussions and ended up taking a phased approach to impact. And our first stage has involved showing the attention or the reach with web analytics data. So we've created a Power BI report that has a dedicated page for each of our open texts, and it can be accessed by individual authors. And it's probably worth mentioning as well that web analytics style is very easy to access, can be easily measured, can appear very promising. So there's a lot of appeal to it. Um, but it's been a lot more challenging, however, to actually recognize what's actually meaningful and accurate from it. So there are limitations that have required some consideration and transparency. But really the dashboards highlighted the attention that open text receive and been a new way to um, just to promote that OER output as well. So we've been able to not only visualize the reach or attention, but to also provide just a single space for authors to explore and interact with data themselves. And um, there's a few groups accessing the Power BI report. So that includes academic authors and library staff as well. And what we're aiming for though is to actually just make this more accessible, um, just as accessible as possible, so that authors can really easily navigate and explore the data independently. So I'll share an example of this work. Awesome. So as I mentioned, we've dedicated a separate page for each open text. And this means that authors can simply select their text and find the data specific to their own text or chapter. So look at academic success. Um, and initially we can see the page views and downloads and academic success had different uh, authors for each chapter. So we've drilled down to this level of detail uh, so that the numbers on page views are actually relevant to individual authors as well. Um, some of our other measures included sources of traffic, browsers and devices and geographic reach. And after a few iterations and some feedback, we chose to include these measures on the same page uh, for each open text. 
um, just to use tabs, which are Power BI bookmarks, to switch between different views. Uh, so we can switch to sources of traffic and we're still on the same page. We've just built upward on the canvas and hidden the other visualizations. So we've got sources of traffic, which is showing the referral path to so the website or search engine that a user has found the text through. Um, and we've included any social media sites, USP's learning management system, which is called Study Desk, um, as well as access via any other university or school um, links as well. Um, so for many other websites. Then browsers and devices was a little bit less specific for reach or impact, but it's provided opportunities for greater evidence-based decision-making when creating open text and gain an understanding of what forms of technology are actually being used to access our open education resources. And then finally, um, under the last tab, we have access by geographic location, so by country. Um, and that's really interesting just to explore between different open texts and subjects um, and to be highlighting reach in that respect as well. Um, and we needed to accommodate several needs for evidence, some around decision making and others to actually highlight that reach and attention. Uh, but we still had to be providing some of those visualizations that were considered and responding to the questions that we were asking. And really, there's only so much Canvas space that could be used effectively, while also facilitating authors and library staff to actually frame their own stories around reach or impact. And within the library, we can repurpose and refine any of those visualizations in other dashboards or communications just as part of larger narratives around openness. Uh, when we were designing the dashboard though, we were also considering what measures can actually signify impact. So I think some of the language that we're using uh, reflects our ongoing discussions around that. So at this stage, we've addressed the reach of open text or the attention that they receive as being at best proxies for actual impact or user engagement. So we've distinguished between attention and impact. Um, and that's where our phased approach comes in, in that we're intending to then collect and incorporate the data on adoption and reuse of open text, as well as later qualitative evidence, uh, just to provide opportunities to actually highlight other voices, uh, which is going to mean that we can extend beyond just quantifying reach and attention that our open text receive to further emphasizing um, the value and impact of their openness as well. Uh, so thank you, and I might pass on to Bob now. Awesome, thank you both. And I'm going to circle back kind of on similar things to what Tara was sharing with her um, screen. So um, I was a part of the team that like Tara mentioned, kind of revamped the dashboard. And I do wanna give a shout out. There's a lot of OEN members in this crowd who use the dashboard on a regular basis. We have some um, data kind of rock stars in here too that we tapped in to create this version of the dashboard as well. So I invite any of you to share or chime in um, if anything is really striking a chord with you. Um, but just to kind of expand on some of the things that Tara shared, I am, don't worry, this is not me sharing anybody's data, um, but this is our test account. Um, and as she mentioned, so kind of the general purpose of the dashboard itself is to track the impact of open educational initiatives of our members. And so um, it does have this capability where, like Tara was saying, administrators themselves can add details on their programs, whether that be a grant program, an event you're hosting, a workshop you're hosting, and who participated in that. And then also has this capability, as she showed, to actually create email campaigns that are then sent out directly to instructors where they can add that information themselves. So it, it hopes for the, um, has that flexibility for administrators to manage, but then hopefully keep the information as up to date as possible with um, including the instructors in the, in the data process directly having them add it to the dashboard. Um, another, one of the things that I think is unique about our data dashboard and one of the reasons that we did want to do a revamp is because we have a number of consortial members as well as individual institutions who are using the dashboard um, who work with one another and there is that overlap between faculty that attend professional development, you know, really OER related events through either the consortium or through their local institution. So something I want to show you, um, which Tara is at the consortial level, and that is the view we're seeing here, um, is, you know, when you log into your dashboard, you see the programs that you have created, but then down below, if I'm a consortium, for example, I can see the programs that my member institutions have also created um, in terms of their open education initiatives more locally. 
So with that, I can kind of see what they're up to. I can see which of their faculty are participating and within an individual faculty profile, I don't have an example on the screen. Um, if someone has participated in more than one program, whether it be at the local level or the consortial level, they're marked on here and you can see that within their profile. So um, just adding that um, and vice versa. So if you're an institution that's a part of the consortium, you can see the programs you've created up top and then any programs that your local faculty have participated in at the consortial level, you can see the basic details down kind of on the bottom of your view here. So we're hoping that that really helps in terms of transparency and facilitating communication between these um, different levels that are working with some of the same faculty members and instructors uh, within the open ed space. Um, and then I am gonna come back to the individual profile. So in addition to kind of, you know, you start at the program level and you can kind of zoom in to an individual instructor, um, you can see the basic information for the person, which in this case, Mia Hamm, who knew she was involved in open educational work. Um, you can collect basic details about a faculty member, make any notes about their engagement in your programs, view which programs they've participated in. And then um, you can also see which activity requests you've sent to them. So what have you invited them to do? Um, you can see details about kind of the campaigns that they've been a recipient of. And then zooming in even closer, you can see how they've engaged as a result of you reaching out to them through the data dashboard. And that would either be by, for example, if you had sent them an invite to review an open textbook in the open textbook library, you can see um, how they've engaged in that way. Or if they have any uh, adoptions associated with their account, you can view that information as well as any enrollments associated with that individual um, right in here. So, and this information, like um, we've been saying, gets populated, either you can do it manually as the administrator, or this is something that perhaps Mia Hamm would enter directly based on um, a communication that she received, or what we call an activity request that she received through the dashboard. And then just finally, to come back to um, the reporting, the, the data slices, these visuals are downloadable. So the hope is that, you know, we kind of, we pulled the community, we're asking what is most helpful in terms of using your data to, for your advocacy efforts and your reporting efforts. And from that, we've put together these different visuals that Tara was showing um, that you can easily download and plop into a report or a slide share presentation somewhere. Um, and then also for our super users, which again, we have lots of them on here, there is a way to download in spreadsheet form uh, your data to extract it and be able to manipulate it in whichever way serves your program or your reporting needs best. So I will leave it at that. Again, knowing that there's a lot of OEN members in the crowd, I did just want to drop a link. We have a documentation site that outlines all of the capabilities of the dashboard with some screenshots. So if anybody wants to dig deeper into that, that is now in the chat. Thank you, Barb, Amelia, and Tara. It's great to hear from you about um, how you've been leveraging different tools, both at the programmatic level and at the resource or book level. Um, and thinking about sort of who has access to that data. Amelia, you talked about really wanting authors to have direct access to the data related to their resource, which is interesting. Um, and so now is the time when we transition to a conversation and talk uh, about the tools that we've seen today, as well as more generally about reporting impact. So um, we'd love to hear more from all of you about what you're working on, what the challenges are in reporting in, um, impact for your OER programs, what you found to be effective, whether it's hard numbers or stories or both. And so with that in mind, um, I thought maybe I'd start with you, Tara, if you could tell us a little bit more about what you do at the state level to sort of share back um, the impact of your OER programs and what you found uh, legislators and others really kind of glom onto when you're, when you're doing that reporting. 
So data reporting is, is a newer function of our state organization so far. And um, I, I am the state liaison from our office, um, but unlike other states, it's a, it's a little part of my job, not, and you know, and so our big dream would be to have an OER, um, an OER staff person in academic affairs like that. Honestly, I'm working really hard to work myself out of that job uh, only because um, we when we have an amazing uh, steering committee of professionals and, and they um, they are they're wonderful to work with. But I wow, I mean, the things that we could do with someone who has OER background working full time in advocacy out of academic affairs would be fantastic. So like I said, my my end goal is to is to get that position built into Kansas Board of Regents. And, and I I think um, I think that's definitely a, a, a doable request. Um, but so what we did last year, though, in an, an attempt to create some baseline da data for our state was we looked at several different states um, and we created an annual survey. So we put that out towards the end of the academic year last spring. So we're getting ready to put another one out. Um, and then we created a report that we could give to our Kansas Board of Regents just on, on those open education initiatives and, and resources. So like I said, last year was baseline data. This is gonna be our first year of measuring. Um, but this year I can tell you, I mean, yes, we had 11 faculty workshops last year. We also did our very first OER summit statewide this past February that was virtual. And, and that was our first um, foray in a year of out of the OEN faculty workshop model too. And, and not that, you know, so looking at different ways to reach faculty. And I remember uh, we had about 350 uh, attendees for our virtual summit. We were really thrilled about that. And I remember just hearing over and over again, oh my gosh, I didn't know there was so much OER happening across the state. And that was from our OER steering committee members. Like these are the people in the trenches and they're going, holy cow, I didn't know all these other people existed too. So I, you know, I've been really excited to see the um, expansion, the excitement, the um, encouragement. And I think we've only just begun to tap some of that, but measuring it um, is, is, a, is, is a beginning thing. In fact, I talked to my boss earlier today and he was asking because we're looking at our performance agreements. And so we're looking at, is there a way that we could put OER as one of the performance measures for our, specifically for our community colleges and, and um, not, not because the universities um, but because it's just one of those things that a it, it provides a, a measure of validity to the um, to the effort and it, it it gives those schools that might need an excuse to try something new that excuse so oh well if it's something that we can put down on our performance um, measures for the next the upcoming year well, what the heck we've been talking about that or we've got some folks that are already doing some of those things. Um, and so that's one thing that we're looking at. And I think as we look forward, we're going to be putting together a showcase where we're going to be able to show our um, board of our our um, board of regents and our legislators all the different things that are happening with regard to OER at our institu individual institutions and combining that with um, putting together our legislative ask and and really uh, so our steering committee is working with our legislative. Um, liaison to to make that a budgeting priority for our board um, in the next session. So so those are the things we're looking kind of forward at right now. Um, and I think I'm hopeful the data will will help us in that as we continue to grow with that. But I'm also because of these graphs that I've been playing with recently, I'm I'm tempted to see if some of those questions maybe can get in or if there's a way that we can capture some of that because like I said it's pretty powerful it's hard to capture student savings and quantify that but man when we can I think that's that's really that starts really speaking to um to our to the um to the the power players right I mean to the decision makers and the money and the money holders mm -hmm. so mm -hmm. 
Sarah, and you know, your excitement around what you can do with this data reminds me of what Emily was saying about, you know, thinking just beyond beyond the reach and just beyond those numbers. Um, Emily, I'm curious if you could take us with you to some of those discussions that your team has been having around other ways to demonstrate value and impact. Um, you showed us a lot of really excellent book level metrics, but I'm curious about what the ideas uh, are in sort of your discussions. What is brewing and where do you see yourselves going as the next step? Yeah, so um, for starters, like looking at extending beyond reach um, and attention, we were looking at the language around how we communicated impact um, and considering what we were actually counting as impact. Um, so we considered whether what we actually were, were uh, what we were collecting could actually show impact and reflecting on what was being counted or emphasized when we were tracking page views or downloads. Um, so we chose to make that distinction between impact and attention. So page views might show the attention in open text received or interest in it, but not how it was actually engaged with. Um, and there's some presentation slides, I think it's by Luke Baruda on the impact of open that really explores this. Um, and I'll share it in the chat in a little bit, but it's on open access metrics. But a lot of the ideas around how we measure impact and what's worth counting are really relevant to explore with OER too. Um, so across the different stages of our approach to impact, some metrics or evidence won't necessarily show that on their own, but they will show that reach or attention um, that an open text receives. And I think that's where we need to be actually critically reflecting on what's meaningful, us, meaningful for us to actually be collecting and how we can demonstrate the meaning and value a user gains from open text. So not everything's gonna be worthwhile counting or is gonna highlight um, impact or even attention in a meaningful or relevant way. Um, and that's also gonna vary a lot between different local contexts and different stakeholders as well, depending on who this is being communicated to. Um, moving forward though, um, Adoption is going to be the next part of our stage. So looking at reuse, attribution. Uh, so part of that would be internal and include the use of textbooks and courses. And so that internal reporting would really just help to collate USQ activity around OER. Um, and separate to that would also be adoption of USQ texts by other institutions as well. Um, and we can explore different approaches to how we're actually communicating that next state of evidence, um, how we might incorporate it with what we're already collecting, and also just keeping to um, up that reflection on our current stage and revisiting the questions that we're asking around the data there, whether they need to change, whether we need to change what um, we're collecting, how we're communicating it, who we're providing access to, whether we need to be building um, other dashboards or other means of communication around it as well. Um, so yeah, that's really where we're heading with that. Thank you so much. And Michelle is asking, uh, I think for any of our speakers, if any of you have tied this back to retention or completion, and I'll extend that question to everybody here on the call, if you've had a chance to use the, the data you've collected around your OER initiatives to talk about retention or completion of courses um, that you've seen your students um, perform better with OER. I mean, it sounded like this is something that you're hoping to do with the next iteration. Barb, is, is this something that you could get from that adoption form information in the dashboard, or is that a uh, perhaps future feature? Yes, I think that would be a future feature. A lot of our, like, kind of like Tara said, a lot of people are just kind of hopping into the adoptions part. So it's going to be exciting what we can do with that. I yeah, think that's very. Yep, go ahead. No, I was just going to say, I think it's more of a function of course marking. And once you can get your course marking in at your institution, then you can kind of trace that uh, GPA and maybe do some comparisons there um, or at least follow your students. That way we have we have a couple of our institutions that um, have uh, fairly elaborate course marking systems and are able to do some tracking. but. I don't know that I don't know that I've seen anything that has tracked them all the way to retention or completion that way, but I do know that course marking um, is pretty helpful in that. Not not just I mean course marking is helpful for students knowing how to sign up for classes, but I also think there's a there's the other side of the course marking piece too, where you can follow that and track that data on the backside. Yeah, and I was just going to say very early um, stage for us 
um, at your school as well in this area and um, probably Australia, um, I think as well. So it's just something that we're going to continue to explore um, and yeah, very much a staged um, process. Thank you. I'm actually wondering if, um, you know, Tara, you talked a lot about reaching out to legislators and administrators and stakeholders, but this retention or completion question has me wondering whether the authors who might have access to the data at USQ, um, what has their response been to seeing sort of the impact and has that driven any um, desire for change at the classroom level in terms of pedagogy? Um, because that's also another way I think that we can talk about the impact of, of OER, right? There's that student piece, but also the faculty or teacher side. Um, yeah, absolutely. So I'm not sure about um, actually in courses themselves, but we've received plenty of positive feedback um, from several stakeholders, including authors themselves. Um, so we took the time to actually walk through uh, groups of authors from each open text through the dashboard. Um, and we've got plans as well to record um, some more walkthroughs around that um, just to make sure that everyone's familiar with how they can use it, any of the limitations associated with it as well. Um, and some authors have actually felt uh, really encouraged or driven by it to want to create more open text. So that was some really positive feedback that we received as well. Um, it's also prompted several changes in the design and granularity of the dashboard. So, you know, from the outset, each, you know, um, each text had its own page, uh, but we realized that a lot of the data around that wasn't, wasn't just page views or downloads was being missed because everyone would just go to it create their own page and forget that the rest of the dashboard exists, which existed, which is why we changed the navigation around to include that data on the same, on the same page there. Um, and also filtering down to day, um, that was another request we had um, and some other changes that we made. But on the whole, it's been, yeah, really positive feedback that we've received from our academic authors. Um, um, yeah. Thank you. And I see, Adrian, you seem to have sent me a message um, in the, the chat, but perhaps you'd like to share it with the larger group around um, other ways in which USQ others have used this data. Yep, Adrian mentions that they've also used the data in academic promotion rounds um, for learning and teaching fellowship applications and thinking about their learning and teaching practices. And Tara, you know, you were talking about advocating for that OER staff person. So it seems like there is a way in which to make the case for it and to help with that uh, either career advancement or carving out of new roles as well. Well, and one of the things that our one of our institutions did that um, sounds kind of um, I know counterintuitive at first, but I think it's really, really popular is they with their course marking system, they they indicated all of the, you know, low or no cost courses and added a very small stipend $10 stipend that that the student would pay in lieu of, you know, obviously, you know, larger textbook fee. But with that, that that money, the money paid for those students in those courses, a portion of that money goes to back to the department for OER initiatives. And so there was incentive to create um, more, you know, for for faculty to, uh, you know, revamp their text and their curriculums to using open education resources when appropriate. Nobody was pressured, um, but they had they had access to resources if they wanted to use time or to go learn or you know whatnot they had a pocket of money that they could use for their department in the effort of OER to add more OER courses to their department the other the other part of that stipend fund went back to the university to do um, again OER grant programming um, school-wide and so while it was a very small cost to each student in those OER courses it helped fund more OER initiatives and create that initiative, that um, motivation for faculty to take that step and maybe um, stretch themselves or add another OER class. Because again, the more classes you had, the more money you generated for your department. So, you know, there was a little bit of a win-win there. Um, and I think that that also helped, that also helped um, kind of encourage faculty. Thank you, and thank you also to Amelia, who um, put a link in the chat with uh, for a presentation. Impact cannot be measured, and other sad half truths about impact measurement. Not having seen this presentation, I'm just going to take a leap and say that I identify with the title, 
Um, because I do think that that is sort of a larger, if you will, philosophical struggle with what we're talking about today in terms of, you know, wanting to quantify everything, wanting to put a number on something, um, just kind of looking for ways that we can quickly tell people why these programs matter. And sometimes that can feel reductionist or frustrating. Um, and yet it's also understandable that we probably need more than stories. Um, so that's kind of the, the position that we find ourselves in. And so um, very happy to kind of talk about that too. Um, Amy, I'm not sure what you were ha ha me to. Uh, <laughs> oh, who, who presented the webinar? Anyway, I invite anyone to chime in. Um, maybe uh, just in thinking about some of the, the things that our guests have been reflecting on, I wonder, Barb, in your role, because you hear from so many um, new OEN members who are being onboarded and perhaps just getting their program started, do you hear about what they're doing, what how they imagine tracking impact or pressures they might be under to do that? Or what are those sort of early conversations and inquiries like? That's a good question. I think um, it seems... Um, overwhelm it's a, there are some people that come at it like we've we've done the more anecdotal things because of capacity measures that we don't have the capacity to be crunching the numbers in the way that we would want to and so when our conversations around the dashboard kind of come up they see that as as a boost to what they feel is a very valuable piece of of this advocacy and reporting which is the student voice which is um kind of the more storytelling behind it so um, and that kind of feeds into what Tara is saying too. I think there's there's always a concern around capacity, but I think in my in my work and in my conversations, a lot of what I say to people just starting out is that in the in the culture of open, relying on those and con connecting with those who are further along in their journeys and kind of learning from maybe the bumps that they faced along the way is probably the best way to go. So. Again, some of those people that I meant kind of name drop are in this call right now and I invite them to join in. But I think what I've heard also from the more experienced people is kind of how they've gotten to their processes of the way that they use their data, the challenges that come along with it, because it is so involved, especially when you're talking about multiple adoptions and multiple people who are parts of multiple programs and how do you quantify kind of the return on investment um, when there's that overlap between um, programs and people in them and and kind of what your instructors are doing. So that is always kind of my biggest takeaway is lean on and rely on those who have come before you and kind of worked out some of those kinks. And we're lucky to have a lot of those people in this call and in our community. Thanks, Barb. I'm just going to allow for an awkward pause in case any of those people care to chime in. It was worth a shot. Okay, Caitlin in the chat, thank you for your question. Uh, Caitlin's curious to hear your biggest hopes for this work, whether that's funding and policy change, finding non-traditional ways to measure student success and impact, perhaps increasing capacity on your local teams. Um, those all sound like great incomes. Are any of them close to your hearts? I'll jump in and just say incorporating some qualitative um, evidence into this body of work, whether that's separate from the dashboard itself or whether we incorporate um, aspects into that dashboard or you know, create uh, more work from it. I'd yeah, love to um, see some other voices included just beyond the quantitative um, reach. I think I'm most excited to see what we can do from the statewide level and if we can take it from a volunteer steering committee um, effort to something that is more policy either legislated or you know just policy um, written um, i think we've got support but we don't have anything written down yet so i'm excited to see if that materializes for the state because i think it would be really exciting but honestly, one of the things I love about OER the most is there just isn't, there's no downside, right? I mean, there's just, it's all good. It's just, it feels good. And regardless of, as long as you're taking steps forward, 
it, it's exciting and I love seeing people get connected. Um, I love seeing people get, um, I, I love hearing the student stories, but I also love hearing the teacher stories about how uh, it, they feel like they're doing something good for their students and they're, they're more free to teach. Like, it, like I said, there's just not a downside um, in my perspective. Um, and so I just love following where the work takes us. Thanks, Tara and Amelia. I, I will pause for a second on student stories. I'm curious to hear from our group um, when we say student stories, if most of those focus now on, you know, hey, this was a, a free resource that I could access from day one, and that's made a huge difference in my educational career, or are student stories also more um, sort of open pedagogy based or reflecting some of the open practices that faculty are engaging with students in creating these resources? Are there, are there kind of both of those kinds of stories out there? Do you think that they, um, hit decision makers or funders in a similar way or that they kind of serve different purposes? What, what thoughts might this group have on that? I think they're both. I think it can be both. And in terms of that qualitative, I know, the gut reaction is to say if it's qualitative or a story, it can't sell to policy or legislature. But I think it's just finding the right way to tell that story and share that impact. And maybe it's not a number, excuse me, maybe it's not a number, but you know, breaking down that data and the number you do have of maybe showing like equity or how accessible things have become, or there are always ways to weave in selling points throughout stories. Hopefully that made sense. <laughs> made sense. I think what you're saying also, Caitlin, is that big reminder of um, this is not work in a vacuum, but this is work for people, right? Whether it's the story of the students being impacted as you were sort of gesturing towards Karen, or um, I know, uh, Tara, you talked about doing a showcase to the Board of Regents and legislature. Could it also just be a faculty or librarian or sort of educator showcase of the various champions who've attended all of these workshops, who've seen all of this tremendous growth, who've changed their practice, who are bringing all of these different ways of uh, hopefully innovative, more student-centric, empathy-focused, trauma-informed ways of uh, teaching in the classroom? Um, I think that is definitely a, a lot of different types of uh, a lot of different types of stories to share um, and I wonder if the, the focusing on the people and sort of encouraging um, some conversation around that is on your radar um, any of the three of you and I don't know Barb if you've heard from other OEN members whether that's something they have done or are planning to do well I think for me, the hook or the connection with those policy makers and stakeholders is everybody knows about college textbooks, right? And and buying the textbooks, everybody's got a story from when they did it, or they have, and they have their 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 own child story, blah blah blah. You know, that's the that's the that's the place we connect. But I think to Caitlin's point that's not the only story that's being told. And you hear the stories, and it's not just from students that are economically disadvantaged either. You hear this from every income level, from every college student across the board. Well, I decided I didn't wanna buy all the books for this class, right? Um, you know, but what I love about it though, is sometimes when you go and you ask students on campus, what do you think about OER classes? And they go, what are you talking about? Oh, you know, and you explain, oh yeah, sometimes those are their favorite classes like sometimes those are the most engaging classes and the classes that they um you know they'll go oh that teacher was the best teacher i had that was the best class i had and you hear that just as much as you hear and i didn't have to pay for the book right like so and that's what i love about this is it goes hand in hand so yeah we start there but it's when you unlock the teaching and you get connected um you know faculty can unlock their teaching and you're creative with their teaching connects with students in different ways students aren't stressed out and they can connect from day one you know it's it um it, it's just more than saving money on textbooks so 
Um, yeah, and I agree. I, you know, to your point, our showcase is going to highlight all the OER initiatives happening on our on our institutions, not just that student voice, but you know, all the initiatives that have been happening. And we had a student speaker, um, keynote speaker for our summit, and he literally stole the show. So you know what I mean? You can't go wrong with that student voice ever. Yeah, that's definitely something we're always mindful of because in these conversations, which is faculty or librarian focus, we don't have a student in necessarily in this room. So I'm always mindful of that. Amy, why don't you go next? And uh, uh, Emily, I saw you unmute as well. So I'll pass it over to you after. Yeah, um, I'm curious if anyone else was in the MEC presentation this morning that Katie Zabak um, gave. It was so she was presenting a new um, document that MEC, which is the Midwestern Regional Compact, created about um, trying to find um, standardized ways to measure um, student savings impact and um, cost benefit analysis. I loved that she took that approach because there's costs to any implementation of course materials, whether open or not. Um, anyway, it was a really tough crowd in the chat and a lot of um, back and forthing about which dollar amount is correct. And, you know, should it be 68? Should it be 116? And I was like, I, I didn't want to jump in on the dollar amount because I feel like um, the way that this conversation has been emphasizing, um, there are so many impacts that go beyond whether it was 68 or 78 dollars right um, and also just the fact that i hear from students that a 10 dollar book can be too expensive a 10 dollar book can be a barrier to success truly so um the just trying to figure out the real dollar amount can feel sort of quibbly at that point um anyway i just wanted to um say that that um report is out i'll i'll dig around for that link i think it's still open in my browser but um I'm hoping that there will be more discussion because it feels like a really major entry into the conversation to talk about cost benefit analysis. Um, and also just the way that this conversation has has unfolded going um, to the more qualitative um, pieces that we can share that talk about importance um, I'm just really appreciating that approach. Amy, I think I found the report. You can tell me in, after taking a look if that's the, the one you were referring to. Emily, over to you. Yeah, so just on the topic of conversations and stories, um, I think what everyone's been speaking to is why some of our initial conversations before we even started looking at the data were actually so important. And while we did end up drilling down to more data-driven questions, we actually started with that bigger picture um, with values driven questions around looking at what openness means as a value to USQ um, and to anyone actually involved with that process, including students as well. Um, and yeah, we did that before we started refining questions around the data itself. And it was really great to actually have, just, just to be starting from a values based um, kind of approach to how, to how we were communicating evidence to what we were collecting and to have those initial conversations around it. I think it really um, defined, I guess, the trajectory that we were taking um, around what we might collect in the future as well. Yes, Amelia, I can really appreciate how taking that values-based approach makes it feel meaningful for everybody at that sort of human level that Amy, Aperva, and, and many of us have been talking about today. And I see too that Adrian had a related comment in the chat. Um, uh, and so thank you for sharing that, Adrian. We are uh, starting to run out of time. And so if there are any pressing final thoughts or questions uh, that you would like to share, there are some great resources um, shared uh, in the last couple of minutes, I'm really curious about the um, MAC report. And um, I know that we have a office hours quick form that we love to share at the end of each session to invite you to inform what we talk about next. We look at them every month during our planning session. So I uh, Perva will drop that in the chat. There it is. We invite you to uh, nominate a speaker, yourself, a topic, uh, whatever strikes your fancy and we'll try and flesh it out and bring it to you in the future. For now, please join us in thanking our guests, Amelia, 
Barb and Tara for joining us today to have this conversation about impact, what that means to us in our work. And uh, it's always nice to see all of you and get together and, and just have a place where we can share ideas and talk freely about what we're trying to accomplish together um, with students and for students. So with that, I'll turn things back over to Aperva for a final farewell. We will just say thank you everybody for um, all of your contributions, your observations, your willingness to share your experiences, uh, and for being able to come across many different time zones today as well. Um, I've always, uh, uh, I always learn a lot at these sessions and I find that especially this, this year, 2022 office hours has left me with a lot of reflecting and sort of ways that we can continue to do more and have greater impact. I think that's what we're all trying to do. Um, so I will uh, just say thank you again and maybe pause for a minute while Amy tries to put that link into the chat, which I think has been accomplished. <laughs> Wonderful. Well, thank you all, uh, Emilia, Tara, Barb, uh, appreciate all of your expertise uh, and look forward to seeing you all next month for another Office Hours. Bye everybody, take care. Bye.